that's okay. So let's let's continue. Okay, so where did we stop? So we discussed Monte Carlo control, but we first started with Monte Carlo control with exploring starts, where the idea is you can start with any possible state action pair combination. The advantage is that you can now learn a deterministic optimal policy, right? Uh, but if you have to remove this exploring start assumption, then like we did a little bit of sacrifice, like instead of finding deterministic policies, like so we came up with this combination of Monte Carlo with Epsilon VD approach, like so which would guarantee to give us the best optimal Epsilon soft policy for the problem, right? Now, I did not talk too much about the policy improvement in Epsilon soft or like in general soft policies, right? So we discussed policy improvement theorem only for deterministic policies. Now, now what if my policies are soft? Like if I make, now I'm not becoming greedy with respect to the policy anymore when I'm improving, I'm, I'm using epsilon greedy, right? So, so the question that we should first answer is, if I construct an epsilon greedy policy instead of greedy policy with respect to the current value function, does it guarantee policy improvement? Is this epsilon greedy policy going to be better than my previous policy? Okay, so now it so happens that the policy improvement theorem still holds, okay? So any epsilon greedy policy, okay, with respect to Q pi is an improvement over any epsilon soft policy, pi. okay? Now this is assured by policy improvement theorem, okay? So now let's consider some policy pi dash, okay? So this pi dash is going to be the epsilon greedy policy. Okay, now I have an epsilon greedy policy. Now let's look at Q pi of yes comma pi dash of yes. We want to show that this Q function is greater than or equal to the value of the state according to policy pi, right? Then we are done. Okay, now what is the Q value of this particular state action pair? Now remember that we are in stochastic case, okay? So this pi dash of yes is itself is not one action, it's, it's a probability over actions, right? So then my, my value estimate is kind of expected Q value. So it's going to be summation over all possible A. What is the probability of taking that action according to pi dash multiplied by Q pi of S comma A? Is that right? So if it was deterministic, then there's only one action. We will just consider the Q value of that action. But this is stochastic policy, pi dash. So like, we have to consider all possible actions. Now, we already know that just for the org max, the probability is one minus epsilon plus epsilon by cardinality of A. For all the other actions, it is epsilon by cardinality of A, right? So I can actually expand this summation. So, so this becomes epsilon by the number of actions times summation over A, Q pi of S comma A, plus one minus epsilon times whatever the maximum action, that or that's Q value, okay? Now, if you observe carefully, the max action is up, 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 appearing once here with one minus epsilon probability, and it is also appearing once again here with epsilon by the cardinality of action space probability. Okay, so now maybe let me take this to the next page. Oh no. Okay. Now, so this is greater than or equal to 
let's just keep the first term as such. Summation over a q pi of s comma a, okay, plus one minus epsilon times. Now, instead of considering this max Q value, I'm going to consider the weighted combination of all the Q values. Okay, so now the weight is given by probability of A given S minus epsilon by A of S divided by one minus epsilon summation over A Q pi of S comma A. <coughs> okay. Now, this looks a little bit out of the box, uh, but there is a reason why I constructed this weight. Okay, so if you look at this weight, if you just sum these weights without considering the Q values, the sum will be one. Why? Because in the bot, in the denominator, you have one minus epsilon, right? In the numerator, you have a times, like for all possible a, the probability of a. So what would that sum to? One. Then you have a times epsilon by a, like number of a, right? So that would sum to epsilon. So the numerator is going to be one minus epsilon as well. So this is like a valid probability, this like weighted, weight. it's a weighted combination where the weight sums to one, okay? now. Simple math here, like so when you have a weighted combination of a bunch of things where weight sums to one, then that is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of this things that you are summing. Okay, so the maximum value is basically max of q pi of s comma a. So, so by this logic, this is a very valid step. Okay, now the step is interesting because once I do this step, then the rest is going to fall in place. So this is greater than or equal to epsilon by A of S summation over A Q pi of S comma A. Okay. Now one minus epsilon, one minus epsilon cancels, right? So you just have two terms here. The second term is minus epsilon by A of S Q pi of S comma A and plus summation over A pi of a given s q pi of s comma a okay so i just expanded the second term now i can cancel these two things so this is just greater than or equal to summation over a pi of a given s q pi of s comma a now we know what is this what is this what is this term this is just value of the state with respect to policy pi, stochastic policy pi, right? So this is V pi of S. So we have just proved that if you take an epsilon greedy action with respect to the current Q values, then that is guaranteed to improve over my previous policy. Okay, so by, so just, so based on this derivation and by policy improvement theorem, pi dash is going to be always greater than or equal to pi. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so now let's go back to our discussion about deterministic versus soft policies, right? Like so, so our current solution can only find soft policies. However, there are a lot of practical situations where finding a deterministic policy is important or need needed or is the only thing that you care about, okay? A lot of control situations you don't want to explore. You want a lot of safety critical situations. You don't want to take random action. So epsilon greedy is, even though epsilon greedy is like a really good algorithm to find these optimal policies, right? It's actually a bad algorithm to use in practice. So imagine you have a self-driving car with, which with epsilon probability, takes a totally random action in the road, on the road, right? So uh, that's a really bad, it's a really bad exploration strategy like to do in real world, okay? So, but it works well like in many other situations. Now, how do I find an optimal deterministic policy without exploring start assumption, okay? So this is where the whole idea of off policy methods 
come into picture. Okay, so now now we are going to classify these algorithms into two types or two classifications. Okay, so one is on policy, and the other one is off policy. Okay. Now, when I say on policy method, like so, whatever algorithms we have seen so far, they are examples for on policy method. So, on policy methods. They evaluate and improve the same policy that they are take, using to take the action. Okay. Now let us look at the. I have to move really slow, otherwise the video will not recognize. Okay. So now let's look at this first visit Monte Carlo control with epsilon soft, right? So if you if you look at this algorithm, there is only one policy, pi. Now this policy is what you are using for generating the episode. And this is also the policy that you are improving, right? Now, as we already know, the exploration, it is only the exploration that requires soft policies, right? Optimal policy need not be soft, right? So, but we are kind of constrained to work with soft policies here because we're using the same policy for both generating the data or episodes and also like improvement, right? So now, what if I, disentangle or like what if I separate these two policies like so what if I have a separate policy to generate trajectories okay we are going to call that slowly, slowly. so we are going to call that policy as behavior policy okay so we are going to use the behavior policy to explore <coughs> and by using this behavior policy, our goal is not to improve the behavior policy. Our goal will be to improve another policy called target policy, okay? Which is the policy that is being learned. This is the exploitation policy, okay? Now, whatever we have seen so far, Monte Carlo with exploring soft or Monte Carlo with epsilon soft policies, they are all on policy methods, okay? So now let's construct an off policy Monte Carlo method, like where we are going to have two separate policies. Now, the big advantage here is I can have a behavior policy which is totally stochastic. That is going to make sure that I visit all the states and actions, okay? But I can have a target policy which is not epsilon greedy, just greedy. And whenever I want to take the policy out, I can take the target policy, right? Like, so, so that, is, that is going to be uh, deterministic and also optimal, okay? Now, now, why is this called off policy method? Because your learning, of, your goal is always target policy, right? So you're learning about target policy, but by using the data generated from the behavior policy, which is, a, which is a totally different policy, right? Like it's, it says data generated from off my target policy. So data generated from off the target policy. Okay, well, off policy methods are more powerful and general enough than on policy methods. Like, so as you can imagine, on policy methods are just special case of off policy methods, right? Like, so you set the behavior policy equal to the target policy, you get on policy methods. However, you separate them into off policy method, then it has a lot of benefits. One, you can learn deterministic policies. Uh, two, the behavior policy need not be epsilon greedy, okay? You can, now you can think about any behavior policy. For example, the behavior policy could be humans. Like humans take action and generate data, okay? Now you can use this data to learn the target policy. Or you could have a heuristics system, like uh, which, is take, which is taking actions, okay? In a lot of control settings, like people have heuristics which work really well. Like so now, now you can collect trajectories from this heuristic and learn a target policy out of it. So, so off policy methods are much more general. And as we will see in the future, they are also kind of data efficient or they can learn with very few interactions when compared to on policy methods. Uh, we will discuss more of these in the future lectures, okay? Now let's see how to construct an off policy method with Monte Carlo. So, so what we are going to do is, okay. Um, 
I think as usual, like we are first going to start with prediction. So let's talk about what happens when the big policies are fixed, then we will adapt the policies. Okay, so we're going to talk about off policy prediction. Okay, via important sampling. Okay, so when I say prediction, I think we are repeating this again and again. So when I say prediction, I'm only considering policy evaluation. So in this case, the policy is fixed. Okay. So, but instead of one fixed policy, we have two fixed policies here. I have pi, let's say pi, which is the target policy. Okay. And I have B, which is the behavior policy. And they are both fixed. <coughs> okay. Now, There is one thing we have to be careful about when we start separating out the policies. What if the behavior policy doesn't take some actions which the target policy takes? Okay, now what if both my target policy and behavior policies are deterministic policies for a particular state? Target policy is taking action one and behavior policy is taking action two. Then it is not at all useful, right? So you will never see state with action one with the behavior policy, which means whatever you're learning cannot be transferred to the target policy, right? So now, so this is the question of coverage, okay? So behavior policy should cover all state action paths that the target policy supports, okay? So the coverage assumption, means that if probability of taking an action is greater than zero for the, behavior, the target policy, then I want to make sure that the probability of taking that action with behavior policy is also greater than zero. Okay, now, can you think about a behavior policy which will satisfy this requirement? <clears throat> Policy. Sorry? Random policy. EQ a random policy, yes, that's a good EQ probable policy. Yeah, anything else? Uh, or the exactly the target. But remember, you have to interact with the behavior policy. You're using the behavior policy to collect data. So sometimes you're doing real interaction with behavior policy. You cannot use random policy. In practical situations, right? Like so, any other better behavior policy? <coughs> yeah. Uh, like a policy B, but with an added uh, epsilon, epsilon three. Yeah. So you could still consider any good policy, but with epsilon greedy, right? So epsilon greedy is also a good enough like behavior policy. So it just makes sure that you will see all the states. Okay. Now. It is, it is not a requirement that the behavior policy be stochastic, all the case, all the places, okay? So, but the behavior policy has to be stochastic in states where it doesn't match with the target policy, okay? If there is a state where they both match in action, it's fine, they can be deterministic. But if they don't match in action, then it is a problem. So in that case, it has to be stochastic, okay? However, the big advantage now is phi can be deterministic. You can also consider pi to be stochastic if you want, okay? But we care about pi being deterministic and that is possible here. Is that clear? Okay, now, the question that we have right now is, I compute returns with respect to the behavior policy and I want to average these returns. Now, can someone tell me what would this average converge to? I'm using policy B, okay? I use policy B and I compute lots and lots of return from a state. I average this. So what would this average converge to? Yeah? Yeah, so this average is going to converge to the value function of this action 
according to the behavior policy B, right? So this is going to converge to V, B of yes, right? But what we are looking for is V, phi of yes, right? Now, how do I get V, phi of yes from returns computed from behavior policy, okay? Now, this is where we are going to use the idea of importance sampling, okay? It's a very neat idea where you can compute estimates with respect to something which you have never experienced. Okay, given you have some, given you have at least the probability distributions of the policies. Okay, now let's construct the important sampling ratio. So, given a starting state st, okay, and the probability of subsequent action trajectory under any policy phi is given by <coughs> so i'm asking what is the probability of the entire trajectory like at after that st plus one after that at plus one up to the terminal given i start from st okay and i follow the policy pi which means the actions t to t minus one are taken from policy pi. Okay, now what is this probability? Can someone tell me? What is the probability of this trajectory given I start from ST? Now I can use chain rule, right? Like so now this is basically the product of what is the probability of taking action T? given st so that can be computed from pi right so pi of at given st given any st and at i want to compute the probability of receive, reaching st plus one so who will give me that probability the dynamics, the dynamics function right so small p of st plus one given st at then again pi of at plus one given st plus one until the final state. Right? I can actually write this in a closed notation, which is compact notation, which is k is equal to t to capital T, phi of ak given sk multiplied by p of sk plus one given sk ak. Okay, it's the same equation, but I have written it uh, in a compact notation. Here, the P is a state transition function. Okay, now if I want to compute the probability of the trajectory, I need access to state action function. <coughs> it looks like it's a bit difficult thing to achieve, right? Like so, because we removed the assumption that we have access to the, the transition dynamics. Okay, now, now let's talk about the relative probability of this trajectory under two different policies, let's say phi and B, okay? So I'm interested in calculating the relative probability, which means what would be the probability of this trajectory with respect to pi divided by what would be the probability of this trajectory with respect to B, okay? Now that is easy. So all I have to do is I can just copy paste this. Copy this. Okay, so that's going to be this thing divided by, okay, I can probably copy paste again and just change this to B. <coughs> right? Yeah. It should be T minus one, right? The product. Yes. Good point. Okay, so now this relative probability, right? Like, so we are going to give this a name. So we are just going to call this as rho. So the rho for trajectory from t to t minus one. Okay, now the big advantage of dealing with relative probabilities instead of probabilities is the fact that the transition dynamics is same, right? It is only the policy which is changing. 
So in other words, the relative probability is going to be just based on pi and b. Okay, so the relative probability is going to be just product of k is equal to t to t minus one pi a k by s k given by b a k by s k. Is that clear? Now, we wish to estimate b pi of s, right? However, we know that the expected value of the returns that we are seeing with respect to behavior policy is vb of s, right? Now, there is a very easy trick to get v pi of s. All you have to do is multiply your returns with this relative probability, okay? So if you compute expected value of rho multiplied by gt, okay? This is going to give you v pi of s. Can someone tell me why? Because this expectation is with respect to b behavior b, right? Probability distribution b. Now, if you think about rho, you have that component here. So when you expand the expectation, the probabilities with respect to b's will cancel, and you will only have the probabilities with respect to a, and that term will be an expectation with respect to the policy pi. Okay, so. In a very neat way, like we can compute v pi of s by just observing gt from vb of s, like and with only one requirement that you know how to compute pi of a given st. Okay, well, if you have the policy, then you know how to compute pi of a given st. So it's not a very complex assumption or like a unrealistic assumption. Okay, is it clear? Now, how do I average? this term, right? So there are two ways to average this, okay? So the first way to average this is, <coughs> one second. So the first way to average this is by, it's just our usual method that we followed for all our sample averaging. So basically, let's say, let us say, I have some tau of yes, which is basically the set of all time steps when state yes is visited. Okay, now all I have to do is just put every weighted return in a list and average it by dividing it by number of times I have visited, right? So, so V of yes is nothing but summation over T belonging to tau of yes, rho times GT divided by the number of times I have visited, right? Now, this kind of averaging, like we're going to call this as ordinary important sampling. OIS, okay, because we're going to have another type of important sampling where V of yes is going to be summation over all the times you have seen the place, like the weighted average divided by, instead of counting number of times you have seen this, you just sum the weights. Okay, so summation over t belonging to tau of yes, rho of t given t minus one. Okay, so now both ordinary important sampling and weighted important sampling, like, will converge to um, the true estimates, okay? Now let's just call this as weighted important sampling, WIS. Okay, now they should both converge, but they're going to have totally different characteristics. Okay, so we're going to talk about Mm. Yeah, this is basically V pi of S. Well, I'm not putting it here because this is an estimate. Okay. Um, so, any questions so far? Like before we discuss 
like what are the differences between do, these two ways of averaging. Now, if you think about it, like we did not have these two options in, in the past, right? Like in the past, we were not we were not adding a weight to the average. Like so, we were just averaging. So simplest way is just add them, divide by the number of times. But here we are doing weighted average, which means you can do weighted average in two ways. You can either do weighted sum divided by total number of times, or you do weighted sum divided by the sum of the weight. Okay. Now, depending on what you're going to do, is going to have different behaviors in learning. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, but before that, are there any questions in the chat? Um, okay, some of the questions I think have been self answered. Um, any other questions? Okay, so now maybe let's talk about like how would a first visit Monte Carlo, first visit of policy Monte Carlo OIS or WIS will be here, right? So now we have two algorithms here. So one is first visit of policy. Well, I think you can call it a soft policy first visit or first visit of policy, doesn't matter. Monte Carlo with ordinary important sampling or with weighted important sampling, right? Now, <clears throat> now let's consider how these two methods, OIS and WIS, are going to behave when you have seen only one return. Okay, you are starting your training, like you're learning, and you just see the state once. Now you have some return, GT. Okay, now let's look at what OIS and WIS will do, right? Like so, now in the case of ordinary important sampling, you have seen only one return, okay? However, this is still going to be an estimate of V pi of S, not V B of S, because you have corrected the probability distribution, right? However, if you are using weighted important sampling, then if you have seen only one return, then the weight of that return is both in the numerator and the denominator, it's going to get canceled. So what you will have is just GT, which means your first estimate is actually estimate for VB of S, okay? In that sense, this is not a correct algorithm, right? So the ordinary important sampling, okay? It's going to estimate V pi of S all the time, okay? However, the estimate that you are getting in the first return, like when, the, when, the, when the first return is seen for WIS, it's going to be, so this estimate is going to be for VB for first, let's say first interaction. Okay, now in, in that sense, WIS is a biased algorithm, okay? Now, let me give you an example. So let's say we are in some environment, like where like I'm taking the behavior policy, it gives me a return of 10, okay? Now, if, depending on how my weighting is, right? Like, so, so maybe with, the target policy, my estimate could be 100 if I correct the probabilities, okay? I have seen this state only once and practically I'm getting a return of 10. Now, should I consider this to be 100 instead of 10, right? Like this is more of a practical question here, right? Like so, like <clears throat> if I have to go by ordinary important sampling, it tells that I should consider this return of 10 as 100. But in reality, when I'm experiencing it is just 10, right? So maybe I should experience it more times to see if it is really going to give me more return, right? So, so in some sense, there is a bias towards believing the behavior policy in the beginning of 
the training of WIS, okay? But this bias is going to go away as you see more and more examples, okay? So these biases are initial biases, like, and because of this initial bias, WIS will have very less variance when compared to OIS, okay? So I think we are also discussing bias variance in the ML course, like this week and next week. So if you are in both the courses, you can, they, it's, it's the same bias and variance. So OIS has no bias. It always gives you the right estimate, okay? But as we will see in a lot of algorithms in the future, unbiased algorithms are always difficult to work with because they are going to have a lot of variance, okay? So this has no bias, which means it has high variance, okay? On the other hand, WIS is not an accurate estimation. It has some bias, okay? So this is biased, which means it has less variance as well. Okay, so in practice, WIS is preferred over OIS, even though OIS is technically correct, right? Like so, simply because it helps you uh, to control the variance. But like, I'm not going to talk about uh, I'm not going to talk more about the variance of OIS. Like, but the book actually has several examples to show you that OIS could have infinite variance and it could spoil your estimates and like. There are a lot of problems, okay? So, but for our discussion, we will just stop here, uh, like related to bias and variance. Any questions? So now we have to construct the algorithm, but before that, any questions? Any questions in the chat? No. Okay, so now we are finally ready to design our first off policy algorithm. Um, now, so far for Monte Carlo methods, I did not care too much about incremental implementation because it's easy to do, right? So you will exactly follow what you did for bandits, okay? But now it is not very clear how to do incremental implementation when you have weighted average. So let's quickly talk about incremental implementation of WIS, which probably you will do in your second assignment, okay? Now, suppose we have a sequence of returns, G1, G2 to Gn minus one, okay? So all starting in the same state, and let's say we also have corresponding weights, rows, we are just going to call them as Ws, okay? So Wi, W1, W2, and so on, okay? So what I want to estimate is the weighted average, right? So I want to estimate Vn, which is basically summation over k is equal to one to n minus one, wkgk <coughs> divided by summation over k is equal to n minus one, wk. <coughs> right? So this is what I want to estimate but I am not interested in storing Ws and Gks as a list because now this is two times the memory, right? Like, so I have to store Gks, I should also store Wks. Uh, now, how do I do this incrementally? So at least for, <coughs> okay, so, okay. Yeah, so now how to do this incrementally? So here's an incremental update equation, okay? This time I'm not going to derive it. Like I will leave it to you as an exercise to derive this, like, but you can, an equivalent way of doing this is Vn plus one is equal to Vn plus the new Wn divided by Cn, Gn minus Vn. Okay. And Cn plus one is basically Cn plus Wn plus one with C zero is equal to zero. Okay. Now, we are going to keep only two entries. So one is my Vn. Now to compute the weight, I'm also compute, I'm also going to keep Cns, okay? You use these two entries and use this update equation. You can do an incremental uh, implementation of the Vn, okay? Uh, I highly encourage you to go and derive this from this, just like how we did this for the gradient bandits. 
Okay. So now we can actually see the algorithm. So, so here is off policy Monte Carlo prediction. Okay, first the policy evaluation phase, like we are not doing the control. So this is for evaluation. So for policy evaluation, which means your policies are fixed, you're just evaluating the value functions. You can see that you set Q values to be arbitrary and you have a C. Now, B is any policy with coverage of Phi. It could be epsilon gradient, okay? So you generate an episode, then you compute these values and Q values. Okay, and you also compute the weight. Now you repeat this again and again and again, like you're going to converge to the true Q values. Okay, now this is evaluation. Now how to use this for control? Now here is how you're going to use this for control. Like so, now this is same as the previous evaluation algorithm, except for the fact that you have phi, which is org max over Q function. Okay, now, your B policy, right? It could be epsilon greedy of pi, or it could be random policy as well, like any policy which covers pi. Okay, is that clear? Any questions about off policy Monte Carlo control? Okay, so I think that concludes our discussion on Monte Carlo methods. Like, so I will quickly summarize what we have seen so far, right? Like, so, like, previous week, we looked at dynamic programming for solving MDPs, which is not learning, really, it is just estimations, right? Now, this week, we started with how to learn action values from experience. So, like, we looked at Monte Carlo methods, which is basically this idea of estimating from sample returns, right? Now, when you want to estimate action values from sample returns, you want to make sure you visit all possible state action pairs. So we started with Monte Carlo ES, right? Which is basically this idea of having exploring starts and it can give us deterministic policies, but Monte Carlo ES is not practically possible all the times. So, like, so, so we need another way or an alternate way to cover all the states, which is through the idea of soft policies. So we looked at Monte Carlo with epsilon soft policy, where the idea is you have a soft policy, so you're trying to find the best possible soft policy. Okay, so that covers the exploring state issue. Now, we still have one problem unresolved, which is you can only learn a soft policy, you cannot learn a deterministic policy, right? So now this is where we have Monte Carlo off policy. Okay, so it's off policy Monte Carlo, uh, which could be ordinary important sampling or weighted important sampling. Weighted important sampling is preferred because it has less variance, right? So now these are examples for on policy methods. And this is an example for off policy method. <clears throat> the big difference between the two classes being that in on policy, you are exploring with the same policy that you're learning, okay? Now, that means it's a complex problem than off policy methods because it doesn't let you go deterministic anytime, like, because once you become deterministic, you cannot explore, right? So on the other hand, off policy methods are really like neat class of algorithms, like where you separate the behavior policy and target policy so that you determine, like target policy can be deterministic, but your behavior policy can be anything that you want. It could be soft, it could be uh, epsilon greedy, uh, it could be any stochastic policy, right? So, um, I, so one last thing is like, as we discussed before, DP is kind of bootstrapping, right? So in the case of, and I'm giving a teaser for next week. So DP is kind of bootstrapping, right? Like, so it, it estimates the value of one state from the next state, right? On the other hand, Monte Carlo is not bootstrapping. So it requires the entire trajectory it requires the episode to end, okay? Now, we cannot use Monte Carlo methods when we deal with continuing tasks because the episode never ends, right? And we cannot use Monte Carlo methods in games which has like really long episode. Like imagine you have thousand episodes, like thousand interactions before the episode ends. Like do you really want to wait that long? Like there are a lot of safety critical 
applications where you want to learn from every single transition as quick as possible okay now the question is can we come up with a learning algorithm like monte carlo which doesn't wait for the episode to end but just learn after every time step right so so that will lead us to the next class of algorithms uh, which is the idea of temporal difference learning or td learning okay so so next lecture we will talk about uh, td learning and how it combines the best of both worlds um, and probably after that we have covered all the three classes of algorithms so we will jump to more advanced topics like functional approximations and so on so i will stop here um any questions okay so okay so probably then i will stop the call as well so thank you and don't forget to sign up in grade scope and as soon as it, the assignment is open today like so try to all to make submissions so thank you